Welcome back, Bio 276. This is week 8, lecture 2, membrane potentials and action potentials. So here's what we're going over today and the objectives. It seems like a lot. So last time we defined animals, or at least we attempted to, we talked about animal tissues and how most animals turn out to have either epithelial, connective, muscular, or nervous tissues. We also dealt with the concept of an organ system and organs and why organ systems is kind of a weird phrase with animals. We also dealt briefly with homeostatic mechanisms and the use of these three types of components, so nervous components, endocrine components, and exocrine components to maintain homeostasis. We also looked at positive and negative feedback loops and the fact that they can be complicated. So... Membrane potentials are a universal phenomenon of cells, and <clears throat> it does help if we like to find the term potential. So potential is a physics word, and it makes reference to work that is able to move charges. It's kind of like thinking of like a big pr the pressure that can shove water out of a container. The unit that we use is volts for potentials. In particular, we're going to be dealing with millivolts. In order to have a membrane potential, you need to have two things. You must have a separation of charges, and you also must have a difference in concentrations. Sometimes this is the same thing, and sometimes it's going to be something totally different. Typically, we use ions in order to make this happen, and when we do this, you effectively make a battery. The combination of the separation of charges and the concentration gradient is sometimes referred to as an electrochemical gradient. Sometimes it's also called like an electron motive force, or some people have heard of a proton motive force when you think of like photosynthesis or cell respiration. Those are actually examples of membrane potentials. In order to make a membrane potential, you need to have proteins. And if you recall, if you look at a cell membrane, you can have proteins stuck on the outside or proteins just on the inside, and we call those peripherals. And we could also have proteins that kind of go all the way across, and we call those integral proteins. We're going to be dealing with the integral proteins for this. But also it's worth noting that every time you see a picture, like a picture like this, um, it, it's not right. So the density of proteins on a cell. So if we were to take an average animal cell, something on the order of like 20 microns in diameter, so that'd be 10, that's 5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, so that'd be a space about that big in there, that'd be about 1 square micron. You should be able to get 30,000 proteins inside of that dot, which is insane in terms of how many proteins there turn out to be on the surfaces of cells. In order to get these concentration gradients, we actually use an old friend from Bio 174, which is the sodium potassium pump. And the job of the sodium potassium pump is it utilizes ATP to push sodium I out and move potassium in. The ratio does turn out to be 3 to 2, but that ratio isn't super important. I would hope that you could draw this mainly from memory, but just in case you can't. So what you start off with is this protein in a state where it will allow sodium ions to bind, and when it allows sodium ions to bind, it can also act as an ATPase, meaning it will hydrolyze ATP, and when it does that, it causes a conformational shift. And when we have this conformational shift, it makes it so the sodium ions don't wish to stay bound to the enzyme, but it also makes it so it's attractive for potassium ions to bind. When potassium ions bind, that actually triggers the loss of that phosphate, which is just enough energy to cause this thing to revert its shape one more time. And at this point, the shape of the protein is not something that will hold on to potassium ions, so the potassium ions leave, and hey, it's like we've just started all over again. What this establishes is a concentration gradient, where we turn out to have, if I look at the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid, 
for sodium ions and potassium ions. We try not to have lots of sodium ions outside the cell, but very few within the cell. With potassium ions, we have lots within the cell, but relatively few outside of the cell. One of the things that people also don't usually take into account is the fact that sodium ions have a positive charge and potassium ions have a positive charge. But what that also means is there needs to be a negative ion somewhere else in it. So we need to have an ion somewhere. And it turns out, in the extracellular fluid, so outside the cell, you tend to have lots of chlorides, and within the cell, you have lots of anionic proteins. So the result is, for every positive, you actually do turn out to have a negative. So that deals with the, with the concentrations, but where, where did the charges come in to play? Well, that happens through the use of channel proteins. So channel proteins are incapable of closure. So you can make sure that a channel protein is specific to a particular anion or a cation, but it does not have the ability to close itself. Things that can open and close, we call those gates. So it turns out that if, when we look at membranes, they typically are going to be permeable or slightly permeable to potassium ions. What does that mean? That we actually have channel proteins that are called leak channels. What does that mean? It means a few potassium ions are allowed to leave. So potassium ions can move through this pore, <coughs> through this channel protein, they just don't do it at high numbers. The potassium ion is going to leak out of the cell if given the opportunity, and the question is why? Well, we have high potassium concentration within the cell, and we have relatively low potassium ion concentration outside the cell, so the free energy gradient says leave. The problem is, at some point, the potassium ions will stop leaking. And the question is, well, why? <coughs> because every time you lose a potassium ion, the, you have a negative left behind, a negative partner within the cell. And because there's a negative charge left behind, what we start to build up at first is nothing, but then over time as we're pumping out protons, the inside is, <coughs> relatively speaking, building up negative charges, and outside is building up positive charges. And over time, this is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Unless we stop it. And it turns out there's a law in physics called Coulomb's Law. This is, so Q deals with electric charge. And what this tells us is there's an attraction between pluses and minuses. So the potassium ions are going to leave due to concentration differences, but they are going to stop leaking due to an electrical attraction. That point at which they kind of stall out is a type of equilibrium. And from there, we could actually calculate, <coughs> excuse me, well, what is the potential across this membrane? So if I calculate that, I could do it in math form, where all I do is I just measure what's going on with potassium ions, and I could look at what's going on with the sodium ions. And to do that, I could use this equation called the Nernst equation. So the Nernst equation looks at the charge, the temperature, the gas constant. You need to use this thing, you know, things like that. And we just compare the chart, the concentrations of whatever we're talking about, so like potassium ions or sodium ions. So at this equilibrium point, if I were to take this measurement just for potassium ions, it turns out to have a, a potential, a voltage, of minus 90 millivolts. And what we mean by that is, with respect to potassium, the inside is negative. So it's a, it's a comparison. We're saying that the inside is lacking in charge compared to the outside. Similarly, if I were to do this for sodium ions... I get a positive 62 millivolts, and that's, again, in comparison 
that, relatively speaking, were building up charges inside of the cell compared to the outside. With these two by themselves, it's not really particularly helpful because they're in isolation. So there's another equation that we can use called the Goldman equation, which looks like this. So this is fun. And what this looks at is the concentrations of sodium, potassium, and then chlorides. Turns out those other ions are kind of have to be thrown in there as well. But we also deal with the permeability so the ability of these ions to move across that membrane. And again, potassium turns out to be the mover. So if I go through and calculate all this stuff out, given our concentrations, I'm going to get a resting membrane potential that is somewhere between negative 70 and negative 80 millivolts. Again, all we mean by the negative is, comparatively speaking, the inside is more negative than the outside. If I were to zoom out and look at the cell, there's no charge because overall it wipes out. But if I look at a very nitpicky portion of it, I would see that there is a difference in charge. But again, only if I look in that very specific spot. It's not overall there's a separation of charges. That's, that's not how this works. So every cell that we know of turns out to do that. The question is, well, what cells do anything with it? And that answer is easy. Neurons and muscle tissues. When we look at neurons, there's about 200 different types, and they all happen to have similar pieces to each other. So they're going to have these things that call, they're called dendrites. So these are receiving things. They, they're meant for receiving extensions. They're named after looking like branches. They're going to have a thing called an axon, which is this long axis. In some neurons, they look very much like that. And on others, like this one here, an interneuron, it, it doesn't match its name at all. There's a term called a hillock, which is the attachment point between what we would call the cell body or the soma and the axon. It turns out to be a decision point. If I look within the soma, so within the soma, it contains these weirdly creamy colored things that are called nisal bodies. which led to people like, oh, what are these strange things? We don't know what they are. We don't know what they are. They're mitochondria. Turns out, neurons use up a lot of ATP. And then we have these weird axon terminals. They're also sometimes called buttons or boutons. The way that information flows through an axon is relatively I, the same wherever you look. Information is going to flow from the dendrite to the soma to the hillock, where a decision, yes or no, will occur. If it's a yes, it will flow down the axon to these terminals, and then something happens after the terminals. The fact that information flows in one direction tells you something about how the information flows. Because in particular, like, it never, like, goes, then stops, then reverses course. It's always, it just keeps going in the same path. <clears throat> and what this tells you is there must be some type of delay and reset so that it's actually impossible to reverse In order for neurons to do their thing, they need help. They can't just work on their own. So their help are called glial cells, or neuroglia, if you wish to sound all fancy. There's many examples of these, like Schwann cells, oligodendrocytes, or oligodendroglia. Turns out that these ones here do the same job. But they do so in different spots, or in different locations. We also have things like astrocytes. They're responsible for a phenomenon that you've probably heard of called the blood-brain barrier. Microglia are like the cleaners. They're the immune support of the nervous tissues. And then you have ependymal or ependymal. I don't know actually which one is the correct pronunciation. And these do a whole bunch of other weird functions. So the overall idea of how you can make an extra potential work relies on the concept of the excitable tissue. And excitable tissues use electricity 
So we should be able to witness this electrical activity, and we can even observe it through the skin. You've probably heard of things that measure these before. The most famous of these is an ECG, an electrocardiogram. There's another less discussed option called an EEG, or an electroencephalogram. So that can be used to like, look at brain waves. And then there's another one called an EMG, which tells you about nervous tissue and muscle function. What we see in all of them is, over time, so regardless of which one you're looking at, we can measure a potential, and what we'll see is an, an up and a down, then we'll see an up and then we'll see a down. So what we end up calling this action potential, this doing with um, this membrane potential, is this upswing here is universally referred to as a depolarization. And that's because we are switching the polarities. If you recall, we start off being negative, and we're going to move into positive territory. The other option, which is the swing down, which is this one right here, that one there we refer to as a repolarization, where we go from being positive back to being negative. It turns out the speed with which this action potential phenomenon occurs is actually somewhat varied. It can range from 100 meters per second to about 1 meter per second. And I know that normally it's like, ooh, 100 meters per second, that's really fast. Sound is about 350 meters a second, so we're a third the speed of sound at its best. So it's really not that, really not that great. But if you don't need to travel, you know, hundreds of meters, okay, that, that might not be bad, too awful. So how do we get this thing started? Well, first thing we need to have is a trigger, something to say, hey, let's have an action potential. So what could be those triggers? Turns out other action potentials can start an action potential. You have chemicals that could do it. Uh, changes in temperature can do it. Osmolarity, so how much salt or sugar is in your in your fluids can do that. Pressure can do it. Light, in a very strange way, is capable of doing this, depending if we're talking about vision or if we're talking about circadian rhythm. And what all of these are going to do, assuming that we're going to trigger an action potential, is they're going to open up a sodium gate. So gates are membrane proteins that are capable of opening and closing. It's just a matter of what tells them to open and close. So we hit it, we have a trigger, and what it's going to do is let sodium ions enter into the cell. So if we think about this, the inside is negative, the outside is positive, relatively speaking. So if I bring in a positive sodium ion, what is that going to do? It's going to make the inside a little less negative, make the outside a little less negative. So if I bring in another sodium ion, that's going to make the inside even less negative, and the outside even less positive. This can happen until we reach a, a voltage, a potential, that's called threshold. Threshold is usually something on the order of negative 65 millivolts, so we have a slight change in the potential. And what happens is once we get this potential to occur, that's enough of an electrical change that it will cause proteins to change their shape. When that happens, sodium voltage gates, meaning it's a gate that's opened by changing the voltage, and it is specific to sodium, will open. The result of that is sodium is going to enter the cell due to diffusion, because high concentration outside the cell, low concentration inside the cell, all these positive charges rush into the cell, and it's going to go from being negative six, or negative 65 millivolts or so to about a positive 30 millivolts. And if you notice, we go from a negative to a positive, and this is what we call depolarization. We changed the polarity, or we lost it. Once we turn out to have that positive voltage, what it's going to do, that positive plus 30 millivolts, is it's going to change protein's shape yet again. 
it's going to force the sodium voltage gates to close, and then it's going to open up potassium voltage gates. When these open up, potassium ions are now allowed to leave the cell because of, of course, diffusion. So what do we have? We have a negative cell, slightly positive, actually, sorry, it's going to be a positive cell with negative on the inside, and now we're going to lose potassium ions. Well, every time you lose a potassium ion, it's going to become a, a little less positive. The outside's going to become a little less negative. And if we keep losing potassium ions, eventually the inside becomes negative again. And this is going to continue until we actually overshoot it. So if you recall, the membrane potential was like negative 70, negative 80 millivolts. We're going to overshoot it to about negative 90. And that sucks. So we're going to have an overshoot. At this point here where it's overshot, the, the potassium voltage gates will close and is now in a state of being hyperpolarized. When you are hyperpolarized, you are more negative than you were at the start. So how do we fix this? Well, the sodium-potassium pump. It turns out that throughout this entire process of the action potential, the sodium-potassium pump is doing its job. And it will restore the original concentrations. But it's going to take time for us in this graph of us going up a little bit, then oop, depolarize, overshoot, then come back. This period here, where we shot down too low, is a delay or a refractatory period. And it's going to make it harder to depolarize. And because it's going to be harder to depolarize, the result of that is we can't reverse directions. We're probably not going to be able to have another action potential immediately. We need to wait. It's forcing a pause, which is what we need to make sure that the flow is in one direction and it can't stop in reverse course. So why do we need to let these, let these things move? Well, um, clearly, you know, we need to not just have an action potential in one spot. It needs to be able to move. And one of the questions that we wanted to ask is, like, how come it can move in one direction but not the other? So why can't it? And it turns out we're trying to study this by looking at cnidarians. So hopefully you remember cnidarians are the singing animals, like sea jellies, hydra, and corals. And they are the first to have nervous tissue that we happen to have evidence of. So there could have been a whole bunch of other soft-bodied animals that had nervous tissues, but we have no fossil evidence of them, so we have to go off of what we can find. And we are studying them to figure out, so why do some of these basic things exist in nervous tissue? And there are some cnidarians that actually have the ability to kind of stop and reverse course, and it's a, well, wait, what just happened there? But it's not all, and maybe it's going to shed light on, like, how did our nervous tissues evolve? Propagation of an action potential turns out to be a positive feedback loop, and the reason why is a depolarization will influence its neighbors. So if I have a depolarization right here, what I'm having is these positive charges inside, or this relatively speaking positive on the inside of the neuron, but that's going to influence its neighbors. And what you might get is this might this section right here might reach threshold. If it does, it's triggered a, another depolarization, which means it might trigger the next section, and then we'll get another depolarization, which will trigger the next section. Then we get a depolarization, which might trigger the next section, which will then get a depolarization, which might trigger the next section, and then we'll get a depolarization. So we keep getting a depolarization that will trigger another depolarization.
And this is an example of a positive feedback loop. It's also the propagation of an action potential. It's also sometimes called a nerve impulse or a wave of depolarization. Which one is its real name? Great question. I don't know. I told you before that it can vary in its speed from like 1 meter a second to 100 meters per second. So how can we change that? The thickness of the axon does matter. So the skinnier ones do not move as fast as the big fat ones. This is actually due to um, drag and resistance. So if you wanted to like... And this is actually a phenomenon that we'll talk about later in the semester, but it's called Poissier's Law, which is an engineering-like phenomenon. But basically, like, if you wanted to drink a milkshake, and the milkshake is fighting you drinking it through a straw, how do you drink the milkshake? Drink it with a boba straw. Why is it so much easier with a boba straw? Because it's a wider straw. The end. The other thing we can do is we can insulate the charges, and insulating the charges actually magnifies that electric field that you get and makes it so it's actually going to be easier to spread that charge out further. The insulation that neurons use is called myelin. Myelin is just phospholipids, meaning it's just a whole bunch of membranes. So these are pictures of myelin, and you can just see it's just layers of membrane where this thing right here turns out to be an axon. The source of the myelin are the Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes, which is why I pointed out that, hey, they kind of have the same functioning that they're in different locations. And what they do is they help speed up propagation. They do this through a phenomenon that we call saltatory conduction. And saltatory conduction occurs due to an electric field. So what happens is if I have a depolarization right here, its electric field influence goes out so far. And it turns out it can move about 1.5 millimeters away if I insulate the axon. The node itself is only like 1 or 2 microns in size, so it's really kind of small. But it allows for a propagation of the action potential every 1.5 millimeters, which is like a thousand-fold jump. So I could move, you know, a thousand segments of, you know, one micron at a time, or I could just take a 1.5 millimeter or, you know, 1500 micron jump all at once. This here is referred to as jumping, and jumping is kind of like dancing, and that in Spanish and Latin is salta. So we call this saltatory conduction because it is jumping. And it's all due to the fact that this depolarization here can cause and influence a depolarization, you know, a thousandfold, well, threefold away from where it turns out to be a thousand times its distance. So eventually this has to reach the end. And the end is where we have this phenomenon that we call a synapse. So the end of the axon, there turns out to be a gap at the end of it. There's always going to be a gap. The name of this gap is called the synaptic cleft, and the entire structure is the synapse. When we have a synapse, what we're going to have are two regions. We're going to have the presynaptic membrane, the postsynaptic membrane, and the cleft itself, which is an actual factual space. It's actually reinforced with proteins, but it can move because the axon can move where the dendrites or where the terminal buttons turn out to be. So in order for us to bridge this gap, we have to figure out a way to keep, move the signal from one space to the other, from one membrane to the next. Turns out there's two ways of doing this first one is referred to as an electrical signal. This is not common amongst us animals. It's actually far more common in plants than it is with us. We animals use chemical signals. Those chemical signals 
meaning a signal that is released from the presynaptic membrane to the postsynaptic membrane, are called neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, for the most part, function in one of two ways. They either release sodium ions, or they're going to cause the release of potassium ions. If we release sodium ions, what we're going to do is get closer to the threshold. And if it allows potassium ions to be released, well, that's kind of like hyperpolarization. And hyperpolarization is the opposite of getting an action potential. Hmm. The way that these neurotransmitters get released is relatively simple. So what happens is when depolarization reaches the end of the axon, rather than sodium entering in at that bouton, calcium ions will enter. And it turns out whenever calcium ions enter into cells, things start to move. And it's going to trigger the movement of vesicles that contain neurotransmitters to the presynaptic membrane. And once at the presynaptic membrane, it's going to fuse and release the neurotransmitters. They move across the cleft, they bind to a receptor, we move on, we now have a stimulus for another action potential. It turns out that this is actually a place where many organisms fight back. So botulism toxin works to interfere with this neurotransmitter release. Tetrodotoxin serves as a manipulator and it actually prevents the release of the neurotransmitters. Opium does the same thing and caffeine actually serves to increase the secretion and it actually hyperstimulates it and usually hyperstimulation is bad too. When we look at all those neurotransmitters, because they can either let sodium move or potassium move, we call them either excitatory or inhibitory. So excitatory bind to a sodium gate. So in what in particular we would call this a sodium chemical or ligand gate. So we say ligand to say, oh, something has to attach. If it's inhibitory, it's typically going to be to a potassium chemical or ligand gate. Excitatory neurotransmitters produce what we call an EPSP, or an excitatory postsynaptic potential. And if it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter, they release I, or they start IPSPs, where it's instead of excitatory, it's inhibitory. For the sake of saying it, when we look at major neurotransmitters, some of them are always going to be excitatory. Some of them are always inhibitory. And some of them, it depends on your location. So in some cells, they're excitatory, and in some, they're inhibitory. Next time, we're going to talk... This will be after spring break. We're going to talk about... How does all this nervous tissue stuff do its thing?